Um, and yeah, you are listening to the talk of Thomas Franke about the pocket guide of climate protection. Um, translating for you are Sebelis and Pharma Firma. So let's get to Thomas. Okay, so I will switch to my slides. I hope you see it. So this works quite well. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here tonight, because, but the question arises where exactly is here? So here at the moment is at everyone's living room. My name is Thomas Franke and I'm a researcher for a sustainable digitality. I was born in Freiburg. It's a city with a, with a lot of interesting uh, history. And this, they have been uh, oh, in, uh, in 2003, I, well, uh, I got to Chemnitz and I studied there about electromobility and resource regulation. So why do people don't have fear? And then I was shortly in England and I got to the Uni Lübeck. There, from then I got to RWTH RWT Aachen and I started to start a working group of uh, psychology and we have just a, uh, yeah, between informatics and design and psychology. We have three main focus, um, yeah, the focus. So we say, in the end, the humans have to have to switch, um, but have to bring into balance several resources, internal resources, external resources, and so we have things like car sharing, electronal, um, electromobility, but we have also tools, we, we we deliver various. So we are mainly asking the very same questions, is Simon. That is, what is the central challenge uh, for human resource regulation in this digitalized life context or environment? And second, how can people be supported optimally in this? A, a context of, acti of activity, and if you want a closer overview of what we do in research and publish and do, then you don't have to really, really have to look at Google Scholar. <clears throat> you can just spend some time on our YouTube channel where you can see that is mainly one central formula, and that is sustainability is human multiplied by technology. So, <clears throat> our research on the energy interface challenge, and you can look at the uh, elect electric car issue. So, the kilowatt hours per kilo kilometer statistic has a few gaps, and uh, you can then see what is really relevant here, or you can uh, look, uh, watch the video uh, on digitalization technology for people. This is about the Jan Böhmermann app or the cat videos. And for that last video, there's a new paper as well in the uh, <clears throat> technology for the people, maybe the first scientific examination of Jan Böhmermann's show, containing <clears throat> the picture of an altar. And there is a short link to that <clears throat> at the bottom here if you're interested in that. Today, I would like to talk about a particularly a topic pretty close to my heart, and that is climate crafting. How can we 
make climate protection in every day as easy as possible using digital tools. So how could we achieve that climate crafting, climate protection for the trouser pocket, as it were? So the next 20, 30 minutes, that is what I would like to deal with. And uh, this talk has a very specific aim because we, the, the group that deals with that topic, would like to get in touch with people that are also interested in this uh, <coughs> trio of climate protection and technology and humans, so we're interested in, in impulses. Um, so any ideas that go through your head during this talk, please let us know. We can reach us by mail classically, but Twitter is also possible. And use the hashtag climate crafting, um, or you can use our Discord server as well. And uh, this talk as well, as the others has a pad that you can use and that can be seen in the far plan in the schedule so let's begin with the first question climate protection how urgent is this actually well it seems clear right uh, car driving electricity from coal uh, meat consumption we produce a lot of carbon uh, pollution is that a problem well for 800,000 years, we always had between 170 and 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. So never more than 300 ppm in the air. In the last 70 years, this CO2 level in the air has risen so dramatically, so quickly, as it has never done. On the 16th of January, it was 413 parts per million. And if you see how CO2 moves around in the atmosphere, you, we can see that how we in Europe are uh, carrying a specific responsibility for this. And in a very compact way, you can see it in this graph, the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, the warmer it gets. So the six warmest years are actually the last six years. And, <clears throat> and in the state of Schleswig-Holstein, in the far north of Germany, where I live, this is very visible. Uh, so, most heat records were reached in the last few years, and uh, that's yeah. not Yeah, there's, um, there's like a new... No. <laughs> yeah, you can already see it from a space as well. There's two pictures from the two different space missions, 2014 and 2018 then we have a really huge problem there for, uh, for agriculture. But we are on a good way, a good path, aren't we? There's wind power, there's solar energy, there's LED bulbs. To put this in a figure, oh no, not really. We are still far away from the solution of this problem, so we need to yeah, continue working on that for the next 10 years. We have to reduce our CO2 emissions radically on the world, uh, on a global scale, on the, on the local scale. We have a huge problem in reducing CO2. So that means everyone has to change his behavior, like in mobility or in food and health. And it's just three simple steps. Because we know we just only need to yeah, again, an imagination of our own CO2 footprint, so we know where we are at currently, personally, and then we need to set personal goals, like a personal CO2 budget. And then, as a third point, we need to take measures to reach our set goals, like to reduce our CO2 footprints. So, we need an active self-regulation of our personal CO2 footprints by our behavior. Yeah, that looks pretty simple, right? Three steps, Clim climate change is done. So why don't we get this running? We need to answer the questions, why is climate protection for people so different, so difficult? And the important question is, how do we people deal with costly commodities? We do it every second. We breathe in, we breathe out, we regulate our O2 contents in our blood, we move, we use the power from our muscles, we need to, we try to improve our fitness, we, we use fitness trackers, we wait for the bus, we need mobility, we check our messages in between. So every second our life is regulated, is, is, is resource regulating and 
Um, that doesn't matter if we're talking about time, chocolate, or energy. For every resource, there's the same psychological principle. We win. We like. We like to win over losing. Uh, but yeah, that's not completely rational. Um, pain and loss uh, counts twice against winning. That's uh, what prospect theory tells us. And if somebody doesn't know the prospect theory yet, I can really recommend it. And I have a video tip that I put a link to on the slide um, that some students uh, of my studies uh, at the computer science studies at the TU Lübeck. Um, so to take a look at this. Uh, YouTube link and the link below that as well. Okay, so let's continue. The psychological behavior economics um, helps us to structure our resource regulation and really exciting, we can we can only live forward but understand backwards. So we are this we are making decisions based on what we expect and the experience is the long-term outcome of it and might might differ a lot. So it's hard to us to do resource regulation on our long long-term net experiences. Um, it especially at uh, intertemporal decisions. So taking a marshmallow now or two marshmallows in ten minutes, like the marshmallow tip, it's really hard for humans, and it gets really hard if we have to talk about shared commodities. It is really really hard for humans to make resource decisions on the collective long-term usage. And that shows especially when we are dealing with a shared commodity that's pretty central for our life, like protecting our environment we know today. Yeah, that's the tragic outcomes. And I think my three children who are 10, 13 and 16 years old today, they should have uh, equal access on shared commodities in many years as we have today and then there's a third problem often we don't we, we do know what's right but we don't have the power to do the right thing so we need other energy resources again and that's the second um, research line the second question is really important how can we match the energy to change our behavior on the long term so how we how can we energize ourselves but still keep an eye on our resources? How can we protect the climate on without getting mad about it? Um, human energy is a really central fact about uh, yeah sustainable resource regulation. Okay, so what can we learn from the psychological from the resource regulation for the climate protection? Okay, so there's. We are quite good at dealing with money and time, but not so good with CO2. But why is it that way? What do money, time and CO2 have in common? Those are all resources. And for all resources, there are the same laws applying uh, by the social economics. So what and, and where do money, time and CO2 differ? That's two things, um, education and measurability. For many resources, we learned quite early in life to measure their value and to do rather economic uh, uh, decisions like sweets and time, but CO2, not so much. Um, we have like not as much experience. We have not a long life experience in dealing with CO2. We are climate analphabets. The second thing, some resources we can measure directly or we have good measurements uh, developed for them. For CO2, we we don't have that, at least not much so far. So we need an uh, easy tracking tool for dealing with CO2, measuring CO2. Yet now we can say, well, for time and money, we had like many centuries in time to develop tools and we had a long learning process, each of us, and we're still making bad decisions, at least sometimes. But how should we deal with CO2 in that terms? How should we make this learning process in only 10 years or maybe even shorter because we need to like incorporate those changes in our behavior? And we ask the questions ourselves as well. And yeah, as a working group in psychology and uh, computer science, we need to involve into that question even deeper than we did so far. And together with the EKSH, it's like a uh, a third central actor in Schleswig-Holstein, a German federal state, 
Um, we started by going by bike to by driving our bike to work and started doing pro projects from that. So let's let's meet those challenges of education, measurability, and ask what can be done in terms of psychology and computer science to overcome this climate analphabetism, and uh, what could be done to for, for those central questions for users in the context of individual everyday climate search, uh, climate protection. How can we answer the questions that the people have? What can we do? What tools can we use? How can I motivate myself and other myself? and others. We would like, together with other people and, and exchange with similar initiatives, contribute to a general climate crafting toolkit. So tools and knowledge that all activists in climate protection can use to make climate protection as easy as possible through digital, digitalization. And uh, the tools that we can learn from um, but when you, how can we use existing tools uh, and and mechanisms for climate protection, such as nudging, gamification, or people uh, with tools that oriented uh, oriented on our needs, and make it into a process that is really fun? And uh, one aspect of that I would like to work on. It's not about manipulating people. It's about empowering people in their potential for action. So, in particular, to enlighten people in such a way that they can act in a sovereign way and make decisions, uh, enlightened decisions, and decisions that are based on an accurate mental model and of the dynamic relationship between the behavior and CO2 emissions. And here again, we have a further very interesting and central psychological construct, and that is mental model, a concept that plays a role wherever we as people are dealing with complex systems, are faced with complex systems, so many of our everyday contexts. And again, um, because this is such an interesting construct, a video recommendation from our YouTube channel, um, a video by students of media computer science uh, on the psychology of the mental model. And an entertaining video this is with lots of mouth noises. And we need tools that improve our mental models of the causative relationship between behavior and CO2 emissions. And such a tool could be and would be able to order all these facts, these confusing facts, and would be a companion that would give us a framework for our mental model, a companion app for climate protection, for example. So, interesting question, of course. Now, what does this depend on? How should this be designed? What would be an ideal climate crafting app? How would it look like? So, in our very first study, we looked at that question and try to approach this carefully, where we had 250 young participants. Uh, on average, they were 23 years old, and most of them were students. And we asked these people how they act in relation to CO2. And we've, we noticed that 50% of these ask themselves at least once a week what CO2 emissions are caused by the products they buy. This, of course, was not a representative sample. It was convenience sampling. These people could decide freely whether to take part or not. And we see that there are many questions in many areas concerning shopping, mobility, spare time behavior, and almost everyone was interested in their own CO2 footprint. And many, 87%, we're wishing for an app for tracking, but the reality seems different because 74% say that they cannot precisely assess or estimate their CO2 footprint and 84% use no app in the area of sustainability. And if I believe, if I remember correctly, the app that was mentioned most was Kojak uh, that has some functionality. So what would the ideal app look like? What are the learnings that we took from the study? For one, uh, the study showed us the, uh, that, what, that young people have lots of questions, that many aspects in a term in area of consumption, but also in mobility are relevant. And also we learned that there are two functionalities that are relevant. Firstly, uh, 
It's important that alternative actions are shown in an easily in an easy way, and that the functions are all integrated in one place. Uh, we could say, okay, that's not much new there, but it's important to to note take note of this. And let's take one context, for example, the mobility-related CO2 footprint. How could a solution look like? Um, how can we reduce or track and reduce our mobility-related CO2 footprint? That would be a concrete challenge. So first, climate crafting challenge here. And the nice thing, of course, is that the link between behavior and CO2 in the area of mobility is super simple, because if I move and if I don't move, don't leave the house, then no mobility-related CO2 can be created. So stay at home, of course, at the moment is a super short-term measure to save on CO2 emissions. But as soon as I do leave the house, it does depend which transport I use. And now it takes the expert knowledge, what is the logical footprint per kilometer for different mobility options? And that, of course, the German Environmental Agency could answer that. Yes, they can. So you can find a table, this nice table here of the CO2 footprint. And we have these different values. Uh, that is 500 grams per CF of CO2 for a three and a half kilometer distance in a car, 272 on the bus, 57 on the train. and people that are alert probably can see that I have had a first mistake here because this table uh, assumes one and a half people in a car but I was using my car on my own and the train goes without me doesn't it so how can it be that well let's leave at least this detail question aside for the moment and um, so, how could an app look that uses this data and could start this way? May I track your mobility? And, and it could look like this. And then the question could be, which weekly budget do you want to set yourself? Uh, quite close to a fitness tracker. And uh, you could say, oh, I have recorded this distance of three and a half kilometers. Um, how did you cover that? Ah, using a car. So, so that, that was about 600 uh, gram CO2. That's about 8% of your budget. And retrospectively, I could uh, check my activity, my CO2, etc. And I could have some weekly challenge. Next, for instance, next week, 10% uh, less CO2. And these are many functionality that we could uh, do in such an app. That was uh, only. That was uh, an excerpt of the current master thesis of Kim Falbusch. Well, so the tracker for CO2 could maybe be a good self-regulation to to uh, for CO2. And yeah, that already was it for tonight. Tonight I wanted you to show how how ex exciting it is to combine these topics of uh, digitalization, social so, well, sociology, etc. Et and if you are interested in the topic, then I have a good news for you. The central part of our uh, project is because to he is one of the DSG of uh, the GDPR parents, and we're going to have a con uh, together event with him, um, a digital event on the first of July, twenty twenty, digital event, and we want to find digital solutions with all participants to make it as easy as possible. And all informations we are going to publish on our website www.climate-crafting.org. Today, in the last couple of minutes, I want to do the first step together with you because we are looking for climate crafting challenges. So what are your climate crafting challenges? What do you mean by that? I mean something like problems, questions, topics, things we could address where, do, where you think that should someone think of a solution for that today. I thought of the context of mobility. I showed you one climate crafting strategy and maybe already showed this kind of solution. And 
How can we track our CO2 related footprint uh, in current terms of mobility and maybe even reduce it? But there's probably much more questions where people think, well, we need solutions for that, um, maybe uh, to answer questions we have about climate and our daily diet, uh, no matter if it's heating or travel or clothing or anything else. We are really interested what your difficulties are or difficulties see from your point of view. And maybe you have a first idea what kind of solution would be appropriate. Maybe you want to try out if the solution works or what others think of it. Because we never know, maybe we find a solution for this challenge that we can develop together. So we really look forward to your challenges and ideas. And uh, as a preparation for that, we want to collect challenges and ideas together with you. We have two channels for that. For the first hand, that's our Discord channel. Here is a short link at the bottom of the slide. And the email address team at climate-crafting.org. And we really like to get your challenges and your spontaneous ideas you get after these talks. We want to collect them and to incorporate them in our project. So starting today until 15th of April, so a really short time, but you, you don't have to think about too long. It can be just very war talks. Just bring them in. And yeah, thanks a lot for your support. That's all of me. Okay, so he's talking to the Herald, and we are ready for Q&A. Yeah, thanks so far, Thomas. I think I'm, I, I think you see myself, and we head over to the questions. We have plenty of time, so we can really take our time here. Just a moment, yeah, really the first question, why do you expand that the climate crisis can be solved by individual uh, solutions because, because our system gives ideas of yeah, bad behavior? That's a really important point, but I don't think it's an exclusive decision, it, it depends on both, no matter what kind of things our system proposes on us, we have to do with the change. It's good if we have external things like CO2, taxes or something, regulatory uh, approaches are really important, but there's much of things we can do today without having lots of pain in our resource regulation. And um, I think the question is, for me at least, not about changing behavior, but also uh, getting to know about our own CO2 footprint. I don't know who knows about his own CO2 footprint or what would be his goal. What can I, yeah, what kind of CO2 emission can I produce per day? Um, our goal would be about 2.7 kilograms per day. That's really not much. Uh, if you go to the Umwelt Bundesamt web pages, you can have a look at that. So it's a really important point. But for me, yeah, it's like a really important thing. But we are taking a look to an additional aspect, and I hope that's an answer to your question. Yeah, is, uh, he is going to add something in the pad. There's the next question that really fits to this topic. Is the most is the largest climate killer not the industry? Yeah, if you have a look at it, we could say, oh, we, as in Germany and Europe, we are not as bad as maybe China or maybe the US or our we as citizens we are not as bad as the industry of course that's yeah there's much to do in that topic and i don't want to give any examples because it's not my main topic but uh, i don't know what kind of industry emits, uh, emits uh, what kind of amount of co2 but there's a big portion and that's our daily activity and daily behavior and I think we can take responsibility in that area and uh, yeah, why I'm not, not saying why should I change if others don't change, but uh, thinking everyone has to change, everyone has to contribute and even if our contribute, contribution feels small, we have to say what can I do myself personally, what can I change and we have to think about that and uh, yeah, thinking uh, on how many people are living on the planet and it's a good point to start and maybe 
something that also does for our own well-being. Um, I don't have to... Yeah, it, 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 we shouldn't talk about um, making accusations to ourselves, but uh, but about feeling good because we're doing something. And it's really, really useful to make an influence and make a change. And there's uh, many initiatives, uh, maybe decisions on investments, uh, or yeah, political pro uh, processes, and I think in the end we have to start in all areas at the same time. And that area I'm showing is just a small um, brick in the wall. Yes, I wanted to insert that as well, uh, because they, they produce the things that we buy. If we don't buy them, it's not going to get produced. But that's a complex path. There's a question about the methodology. As, uh, so asking students is easy. Yes, we've done that. Are there concepts how we can reach parts of society that are further away from education? Yes, absolutely. Good question. Um, right. First, the ambition it absolutely is that we should be inclusive, not not just various groups in society that are more or less con connected to education can be reached, but also that uh, there are different attitudes towards climate protection, and that's it's very important to, to respect the diversity and in include that and and get to an inclusive kind of climate protection or try to move that forward. That's a very important challenge. Uh, we may that we don't uh, create a certain resistance and, and take the people from where they are. And uh, the question of is what do we focus on? And this this diffusion of innovation um, motto by Rogers, taking that, the people that we reach first are the early innovators or the early adopters. And from then, slowly we could move on to other areas. And that is why the necessity to act is so much more urgent because this diffusion process through, through the society has to be regarded as well and taken into account. But 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, I started with this kind of research or could, to look into the area of e-mobility. And uh, we were working with companies such as Vattenfall and others in Berlin in 2008 and 2009. And we ran a field trial uh, and tried to equip early adopters with e-cars e and, and see what problems these people faced and what their reach was. And no one could really imagine that electric cars would come uh, about at a, on a wide scale. And 10 years later now, we slowly get to a situation where many more people can imagine uh, buying an electric car as the next vehicle. And so there is a certain diffusion process, but I do admit that we may not have the time to wait for this diffusion process. We have to deal with the problem how to reach other areas in society. And of course, yes, we start out easy. We start with those where we can uh, reach an effect, but we cannot ignore the rest either. Yeah. And also the, these movements in society don't develop in a linear way. There is uh, always uh, a threshold that has to be reached and then things start moving and it gets back and goes back and forth. And this crisis that we have, maybe this is such a moment that could uh, kick off such a change maybe. And that lets get us to the next question. In CO2 consumptions, we consumers have to be able to measure uh, what we cause, and isn't that a problem that we don't really know or cannot measure? Because where do I get the information from? Driving a car is very simple. Yes, let's take a more complex area, because there is various very, very interesting questions involved. Um, if we have a certain resource that we can uh, feel physically, such as heat or cold, that is something that I can use. I have sensors in my skin for that or the quality of air I can perceive directly and others. So there are resources that I can experience directly and other resources such as CO2 is so abstract, I can't even touch it. I have no way of sensorically perceiving it. So 
we are we have a quite diff, difficult situation and I could talk a lot about that but that will perhaps not be so interesting towards a very con, con, concrete example and that is food uh, because food contains a lot of co2 consumption it's not as it is with the car it's not at the moment that I press down on the pedal that uh, and and accelerates that I actually physically uh, produce CO2 from my exhaust pipe but when I buy the milk package that kind of contains the CO2 consumption it comes with a backpack uh, of CO2 consumption arrives with that in the supermarket and much of this I can actually track there are experts in eco um, uh, analysis and there are companies and startups that we are in exchange with that deal with exactly this topic how can we balance or summarize the CO2 consumption back to the factory gate but what happens after the factory gate is something that I cannot easily print onto a package either because it's not just about a traffic light style of um, um, marking on, on my package concerning sugar, but also concerning CO2 consumption. But at the moment, the product leaves the factory gate. Of course, I have the logistics involved as well. I have storage and so on and so on. So the question, what do I all involve in this analysis? But it is possible. The data exists. We can collect the data. And another interesting area, and again, with my long monologue answer, another answer, uh, the issue, of course, is digitalization, how much CO2 is used by one hour of YouTube watching. If you do some research, you can see that really the estimates are very widely so the data isn't that robust on that yet because different computing centers have very different climate footprints and I think we're only just beginning. This is not my absolute area of expertise, but I have been told by experts that the communication links uh, are a complex issue as well. I think all that is possible, but we have to approach it. It's not just possible, but it's also super interesting. and. This is something where we can have very interesting data science and, and uh, conduct interesting research to find this data in a, a reliable and, and, and tangible way. Okay, that saves me the next question, uh, which was about CO2 marking of, of food products. Um, I should mention that the pad, pad mentioned that uh, being remote from education is not such a nice term. Sorry, I apologize. I read it out from the pad. Um, but the question has to be asked. We are privileged. We have time and money, and we can deal with these issues. If you, if I look at others that uh, that don't get any five minutes to, to stop and think, and uh, if we ask how do we search, uh, solve the climate crisis as as a as the whole humanity. Then that is a question. Yeah, I'll, I've stopped for a moment because, of course, there are points where I don't have any immediate answers either. Um, but if you keep thinking and see how many detailed challenges we have, then it is true that we, for the future, that we set ourselves with the Paris Climate Accord, we don't have much time left to turn around. And that is a huge challenge. And the question shows that there are many, many detailed challenges that we have to deal with. And of course, the question is, can I afford climate protection? Maybe I cannot afford a new electric car. And maybe the question, uh, anyway, is whether the electric car is actually useful because for me it would spend most of its time in the garage and the ecologic footprint of the battery would not be compensated by it being used. It would only be of any value if, if I were to um, use it in a certain way and we're building an infrastructure for, for research on that. So, uh, to put it short, after a long speech, I don't have any good answers on that, other than that these answers have to be found at the social, at the society level. And when we look at the thought of sustainability, uh, it's always about 
ecological and economical and social sustainability and to bring these three aspects together yeah it's not easy it's it's hard to get to an easy concrete answer other than it shows us how large the need for research is I admit that it was not an easy question, yeah, but uh, the next question is, uh, we thought about traffic quite a lot, and, uh, the, but the problem is uh, if everybody drives to work at the same time and has to drive through the, yeah, through, through the entire city, then all means of transport will uh, will be yeah will be in the, the traffic jam and in the rest of the 20 hours there is uh, yeah they are doing nothing but still use the resources so what about this charter by Athena can we can what can we do um, could we could we optimize this? Could we, yeah, the concept of uh, the same city for sleeping and working? Um, are you, yeah, are you on this track too? Yeah, I see uh, some points which are in common with our research. I see two points. So the city planning aspect is not our focus, but we have we can observe two two good things. So the current home office trend, of course, and yeah, that has been a, a while already. So it works quite well for our working group, and I also believe that we. This could have an inter impact that the acceptance could be could be better. Maybe um, travels could be replaced by video conferences that they could do better video conferences in the future and not do as many business travels, etc. Et um, there's another project by Google which uh, how to do better video conferencing and we have a uh, for instance mixed reality virtual reality and yeah the, but the question is how could we actually uh, mimic a present a present of somebody who is uh, really there for instance latency um, it's killing quite a lot of the natural interaction. I, <laughs> I did some research before, but uh, it's it's too long for now. If you're interested, just write me. And then, or another or the topic of being uh, auditively present. Uh, how well is my microphone? How good are my headphones, etc. So the problem might, yeah, the problem is that the rooms might be, might be too too different. So it doesn't really feel to be in the same room, and we still need maybe still better technologies, not only better VR and AR, but maybe also better, yeah, better audio. And another point, another aspect is about uh, public traffic from today, which uh, is there a better possibility? With a project in Lübeck, they, they did a white table solution for uh, Lübo. So for, for instance, for the people who are doing partying in the night to drive them home. And we have been, yeah, this project is being founded by the Forschungsministerium to and the idea is how could we better fill um, the, the times where, where the, the public traffic is, is not yet uh, that, that full and how can we reach more people too etc. Maybe for instance I am in Wolfsdorf at the, at the moment 
and the problem is we don't have a bus on the weekend so that's why more people have a car here more people than would be necessary and these are very very important things that that we could still do and that are also a lot of being done already so maybe maybe people also thought about uh, prohibiting working more than a thousand people at the at the same place because it's absurd and it does not make that much sense you talked about Sport. Um, if uh, the question is, if already my fitness tracker has no chance to motivate me or to make me do my 10,000 steps, then so why should yeah I if I do my 10,000 steps, then I really have a motivation, but. Uh, What's the motivation to yeah to to uh, produce less CO2? Yeah, I'd say fitness trackers didn't do the thing for many people. They don't work, but for some people, they are a good approach for daily life. And uh, together with my co-author Christiane Artig, I published two very interesting papers. The first one is probably your other direction. Can I uh, make? Can I depend on my uh, fitness tracker, psychological effect? And the second one is why do people put their fitness trackers away again? And we, yeah, dig it deeper into this uh, motivational dynamics, and um, it's much about adherence. So how can I move someone into this uh, behavior regulation? How can I keep them there? How can I help? somebody stay there in that area of behavior regulation and uh, the first question the question for all people who also who always wanted to try to do some sports uh, um, but didn't do yet uh, then i can uh, can i can send them an interview from last year about the psychologics behind that and in summary many might know the subject of intrinsic motivation uh, you might say uh, i do that because i get a reward for it or maybe i do it because it makes fun and in theory there's uh, many steps in between uh, i can move from the extrinsic regulation to the intuistic uh, regulation and um, that's where i won't do something because of uh, punishment or re reward but uh, to avoid damage because like it would be really uh, yeah, bad if I stop jogging again, so stop doing the sports again. Um, so I can help people to move from extrinsic regulation motivation to uh, intrinsic motivation and maybe give them a, 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 light, a ladder to climb. And uh, often many of those tracking tools, um, they don't use all of the motivation psychologics knowledge we have today. Many think about rewards or maybe financial incentives, but um, there's many more powerful motivators that feel less like a manipulation in that kind. Well, so we're coming to an end slowly. There's one yeah, hard question from the pad. Uh, I have to find it again. In the pad, there's. I think it's really possible that the topic of climate, no, the CO2 footprint, um, was invented from a British PR company. Uh, yeah, the CO2 footprint in the today's uh, yeah debate, scientific debate, is really spread. So I wouldn't think too much about its source because yeah, if I say CO2, if I hear CO2 footprint for the first time, no matter uh, what kind of pages I already have, then I'd say well, it brings it to a good point because what we need, we need met metaphors for regulation we need to make it imaginable for people and the yeah footprint i leave while i'm moving through my life 
that's a really good metaphor to compare this. And uh, the interesting question is, what is, yeah, what makes this CO2 footprint with the carbon footprint? That's like um, an echo. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really interesting part of scientific research. And there's like even some standards, public standards available. Um, so I don't really know what that question really means. I'd say some topics, some, yeah, maybe have some kind of prejudice. So let's think of them fresh, start fresh again. I don't see that much prejudice in this, for this term. Yeah, I don't think so as well, because for the first time I know that British Petroleum uh, are quite interested to take new directions and also that's not stupid people. They know that we catch them sometimes and they do it as long as possible and at some point it's not possible anymore and then they, they need to do something different so they need to have a plan B ready at them already. and. I don't think that the energy companies are dealing that much with energy footprints so far. Okay, it's 10 to 11 right now. And we can yeah, say lots of thanks to you. It was a really great talk. A huge round of virtual applause. Yeah, and it's a marking for a cut. And thanks also from the translation booth.